So the story starts. Thank you. So the story starts in Birmingham, in West Midlands, when I was at my flatmate's house, and it was a scorching hot September day, and I was in the living room gazing at the skyline of Birmingham, and I noticed clouds popping in the distance, and those you know thundery clouds with lots of rain advancing towards the city. But in that moment, I was just sweating excessively like I have never witnessed before. It was an unusual occurrence that happened to me. But as the rain approached, I, start, I started to sweat lo- less and less. And then there, is what, there was some kind of epiphany coming into my mind. And then I realized, what if we, for once, think about planet as a human being, as a living human being? But to make sure that this journey of around 15, 16 minutes will be compelling to everybody, let us focus now on the major topic. I want you to be on the same wavelength and to discuss about weather and climate, and I will give you some analogs. So first things first, weather is what we perceive, what we witness at the given moment. So we witness it, it was sunny, then we write it down, and that's the rest. Climate is the weather, but it was tracked for an extended period. Normally, it takes around 30 years, according to the WMO, or World Meteorological Organization, but that depends, obviously, on many other reasons. But it's related to weather, a normalized or average state uh, of our weather during those 30 years. Now, to make sure that you can understand it even further, I will give you an example. Suppose you're harvesting your potatoes, and potatoes need some variables or inputs, such as quality soil, preferably on the higher ground, lots of moisture, oh, sorry, lots of adequate, uh, I would say, sunshine, and you know, adequate levels of moisture, not too much, not too little. And in that variable, that I mentioned, in a space of variables that I mentioned, that array of variables, you will be tracking it for the next 30 years to determine the quality of your potatoes. And this is where we get interesting. Most of the time, you will notice that the soil will not change too much, you know, everything stays pretty much constant. But the moisture and sunshine depends on the year, on many other factors. And that's where we started thinking about, oh, moisture, sunshine, it can be related to weather as well. So we have already two variables that we are dependent on. It is the same as we say in a weather report, an upper ridge coming from North Africa, across the Mediterranean, reaching the Balkan Peninsula, bringing hot air aloft and causing uh, dry and pretty much settled weather. But there is one tiny little difference that pretty much nobody will notice. We didn't mention the temporal scale. Is it April? Is it February? Or maybe August? It may be dry, as I mentioned, but that small difference determines whether it will be hot, very warm, or warm. So those differences affect our potatoes as well. And then if you put it on the graph, you will see those alternating natural variability cycles where you can actually see that literally in that specific array, you will have an every fifth or sixth year, the quality of your potatoes being superb, but maybe, just maybe, on every third or fourth, you will have less quality potatoes. Obviously, that will determine on many other factors. And that happens with the climate. It has its own frequency, and it has its own trend. And those two terms are the most fundamental when we talk about climate science. And You will see why after I show you this picture. So, it is good to see that nobody left the the auditorium hall. That's a good start. And I want you not to focus at any given moment on these notations. Those sigmas, those, you know, very mathematically complex equations. I don't want you to do that. I just want you to see an arrow coming from the space 
to the Earth and then refracting back to the atmosphere. And why? I will give you another analog for that. Suppose you have a bowl where you will put a 500 grams of your favorite flour, a pinch of yeast, and some oil. Then you will do the procedure. Obviously, you will mix it with your own hands and then put it on the counter to rest for a bit. After that, you will take your dough and then you will roll it out on your counter or surface board. And we come to this specific numbers. 102.6 watts per square meter and 239. That's the amount of energy that our, uh, that our Earth needs to export to the space. To convert that to our culinary analog, that is literally putting 30% of your flour and all your ingredients in that bowl to get those 70% in order to produce a nice flaky pastry. Literally, this 102.6 watts per square meter tells you how much energy will be reflected by the atmosphere. And then the rest will be emitted as a long wave radiation. And this is very interesting, I have to say, and when I was thinking about these analogs, we missed one very important statement. Did anybody consider adding some salt or some spices in that bowl? No. And I will tell you why. So the amount of energy that our planet is emitting in this single slab atmosphere energy balance model, it literally tells us that radiation temperature or bolometric temperature, uh, how we perceive it as scientists, would be a minus 18 degrees Celsius. So the global average temperature, considering no greenhouses, uh, greenhouse gases in this particular example, will lead to the world that will be around minus 18 degrees Celsius. Let's, back that, but let's get back to the dough. And then, obviously, you baked it, and the result is pretty much okay. When you taste it, did you notice something's missing? Of course. It is edible. It is edible, you have to admit. But it missed some, you missed something, and that's salt. It's bland, you know, it's very bland. It's dry under your mouth. It's, it's just not the product that you wanted to get. And in this particular sense, we are, con con we are considering adding the salt, behaving as a blanket to your dough. And that blanket can be considered as our greenhouse gases, which are making our atmosphere being 33 degrees warmer than it should be. And it's basically what gives us lush planet and a comfortable 15 degrees Celsius on an annual base around the globe. And why is this important? This is important because when I realized that if we consider 15 degrees Celsius as a constant, well, pretty much constant. Let's say it's a constant, but it's not. It depends on the year, and obviously human body depends on many other factors. I was thinking about this as an example in a warming climate, as a beautiful representation how we can perceive our Earth, our very own Earth, as a living human being getting, unfortunately, very sick. And that for that, I will give you another analog. So suppose that Earth's system has a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, so amount of energy that entered in must left out eventually to get into the balance. And obviously it's the same for the human body, which is around 36.5, or maybe a little, little less, a little more, depends on, the, depends on the body. Now, if we consider that we have a virus, Let's say that we have a virus in this room and somebody is spreading onto others. You're contracting that virus, you're passing to others. Nobody will 
react in the same way. Some of them will be just minor symptoms, some of them will be asymptom asymptomatic, and some of them will expel, you know, much worse symptoms than previously thought. It's exactly the same what our planet does. It has its own extremes. And because it has its own extremes, that's, that does mean that our energy balance must be in an equilibrium. So it needs to be in a perfect balance. And this is what happens where you're amplifying your extremes, so all weather extremes around the globe can be considered as a symptoms that you're actually uh, producing. So let's imagine that current situation tells us that we are in 1.4 degrees Celsius warmer position than it, than it was during the pre-industrial period, which was around 1850 to 1900 as a reference period. And why we take that specific period? Well, because Irish uh, scientists started noticing that some of the greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, is contributing to the entire picture. And they put it in a compressed a vessel and left it in the sun. The results were remarkable. It started heating so fast, and from that point, every other peer review study showed the same result. And that's why we take this 1850 to 1900 reference period. And that specific point, when you have 1.4 degrees Celsius, tells you that you really need to consider your planet as severely ill. Because if you, if you add that 1.4 to the human body, you will be already in the bed. So, what we can do it, what we can do about it. Let's return just briefly on the dough and the bread that we got from baking. So if we put more salt, then the first reaction that you will have is to drink lots of water. And you do. You really do. That's exactly what, the, what our nature does. It evaporates the rest of the energy. It, re it really needs to release that latent heat to produce an equilibrium. But more energy that comes into the system results in the amplification of weather extremes. And those symptoms are getting worse, you're feeling much, uh, I would say, sicker than usual. And those symptoms that I was talking about, cough, wheezing, let's say sore throat, fever, it's almost equivalent to say, you know, heat waves, droughts, floods, cold waves. Therefore, it is onto us and our generation to start thinking about our planet as a human living being. And that actually means that our role must be more towards nature because the nature is our best mate. The nature is always working for us, not against us. So please, just for once, Think about it and tell yourself that you will treat the nature as your best mate because the nature will never stab you in the back unless you do something that you will eventually make it to harm it. Thank you so much.